Okay, we're going to get started again with our second panel, which is focusing on um, some of the, the detailed kind of implementation type questions um, that come along with these sorts of mandated access regimes. Um, and I'm just here to, to introduce the moderator who will then introduce the panelists. Um, our moderator for this panel is David Lee, um, a colleague of mine from the University of Toronto, although I'm a lawyer and he's a, a, a computer engineering professor uh, there as well as a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Secure and Reliable Systems. David also holds appointments in the Department of Computer Science, Faculty of Law, because we frequently collaborate, um, and is a research lead with the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society, Associate Director of the Data Sciences Institute, a Vector Faculty Affiliate, and a Senior Massey College Fellow. Um, so David has many accomplishments. The rest of his bio you can read online, and I will pass the panel into his capable hands. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah, so um, I'm an engineer by training, and that's what I do. And so we have our own concept, sometimes of implementation, but I'm particularly interested in hearing about the implementation challenges that um, this panel is going to talk about. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First, we have Dalara Darkshani, um, who's at the Data Transfer Initiative. She's the director of policy there, and uh, which is a nonprofit dedicated to empowering individuals by enabling effective data transfers. Before joining the DTI, she was at Meta, where she advised on privacy, e-commerce, and accessibility issues in Meta's Reality Labs division. She has provided testimony before Congress on privacy and technology. Um, then we have Becca Ricks, uh, who's from the Mozilla Foundation, and she's a head of open source research and investigations there. Uh, she leads the uh, digital investigations lab studying how people interact with platforms and algorithms um, such as those used in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Prior to Mozilla, Becca was, at, uh, was an open web fellow at Human Rights Watch and worked as a fellow, as a social, sorry, as a software developer in the tech industry. She was recognized as one of the 100 brilliant women in AI ethics in 2021. And last but not least, we have Hilary Ross. Um, global, of course, who is at the Global Network Initiative and serves as a special projects advisor um, there. She's interested in the, in the governance of emerging technologies, transparency as a tool for accountability, freedom of expression, privacy and security, and information integrity and the future of news. Hillary was a fellow at the Federation, is, was a fellow with the Federation of American Scientists Day One Project and the State of the Net Conference. Um, and, a Fulbright and, and at the Fulbright Teaching Program. She was previously part of Berkman and continues to maintain affiliation here. Uh, and so I invite each of the panelists to maybe talk a little bit about their views. Maybe we can start with Delara here. Sure. Uh, can folks hear me okay? Great, thanks. Uh, well, very grateful to be here today to provide some thoughts um, from the perspective of our organization's mission, which is to empower users through data portability. I'd like to provide a little bit of context uh, about our organization to sort of ground my comments. Um, we initially started out as a consortium of technology companies back in 2018, and back then we were known as the Data Transfer Project. Uh, since then, the project has supported the creation of a portfolio of data transfer tools, tools such as Google's Takeout uh, service, Meta's Transfer Your Information tool. And last year we revamped as a newly formed nonprofit. Um, and today we continue to build upon that work from back in 2018. On the technical side, this means that we're building tools that are simpler, faster, more secure. Um, and as was alluded to on the previous panel, which, which uh, dovetailed very nicely into the things that we hope to talk about today, uh, we do believe the future is direct data transfers, and that's for a few reasons. Some designated uh, gatekeepers are required to comply with data portability mandates and direct data transfers under Section uh, 6.9 of the DMA. Uh, others have long worked in this space to build good, goodwill, and frankly, increasingly, consumers are, are starting to expect to have these simpler, um, more easily accessible tools to allow data transfer. Uh, so while we are not a trade association, we um, remain independent in our day-to-day -day work. We do closely work with our organization's founding members, Google, Apple, and Meta, um, who provide dedicated engineering and product contributions. 
Uh, equally important, though, is our policy work, where our priorities are not only to educate and convene thought leaders that are on the novel questions in this space, um, but we're constantly looking for opportunities to work with companies of all sizes, civil society, researchers, uh, because we recognize that delivering the best collective outcomes when it comes to implementation will re require extensive collaboration um, and cooperation among multidisciplinary stakeholders. I think I'll stop there as a preliminary introduction um, and let uh, you all, is it, does that sound okay? Introduce a little bit more about your work. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Becca and I'm with Mozilla Foundation. So I head up a digital investigations lab at the foundation and we're in the unique position of both being research practitioners. So doing a lot of platform research, primarily via data donation approaches. Um, so we do a lot of tooling. We've built browser extensions that people have downloaded and have been able to participate in studies. Um, our, we built a browser extension called Regrets Reporter that allows us to study YouTube on a really large scale. Um, our most recent study we ran, we had almost 23,000 people who participated and donated their data, which means we had on the scale of 560 million videos that we had to analyze. So we're really invested in building a lot of tooling, especially for civil society research to move forward. Um, and through the mechanism of data donation, crowdsourced research. Um, we're also really invested in the civil society research ecosystem and independent research happening in this field, um, obviously collaborating with academia, but also outside of academia, some of the really critical research that's happening. And so um, in addition to being researchers and practitioners, we work really closely with our policy team to think through um, questions around DSA data access and what we think good implementation um, of some of these provisions might look like. And um, in addition to that, because we sort of were born out of the open source movement of the 90s, we also um, have a particular interest in how data is protected, how it's collected, how we ourselves collect data in adherence with our own lean data privacy policies. And so I think there's, um, there's a bigger conversation to be had among independent and civil society researchers about how we develop norms for how we're managing a lot of this data. I'll kick it over to you, Hillary. Great, thanks. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, it's especially fun to be here because I, when I was on staff at Berkman, the last thing that I helped do was um, to build this institute. So it's really cool to be, um, be back and uh, see what's, what's happening with it. Um, so for some context, um, I'm an independent technology policy consultant. I work with um, organizations uh, to examine tricky technology policy questions, particularly bringing um, stakeholders together around those questions and uh, work, work together. So right now I'm working with the Global Network Initiative. Um, they're a multi-stakeholder alliance that brings together companies and civil society organizations, um, academics and investors to uh, work on freedom of expression and privacy globally. Um, and my own background has been particularly focused on transparency in the last number of years. Um, I designed and launched um, a researcher access to data program at Twitter. Um, so that's where uh, some of my comments and background will come from. Um, and I also led um, a transparency working group at the Integrity Institute where um, I'm a member as well. So that's kind of where my own background is coming from. Um, and I guess I'll say, I'm building on um, what Lisa entered with and what Gabe entered with of there's both, uh, as Gabe was saying, there's been a big drawback in voluntary data sharing um, from platforms to researchers. So we're kind of in a moment where uh, the level of voluntary access, I think, has actually really reduced. Um, at the same time, we are opening into a new regulatory era where uh, we are going to see what data access looks like um, and that's kind of being built and being developed. Um, and so these implementation questions I think are really critical um, because really to get that right um, we need to get kind of the, the details of who gets access, what kind of data is granted, uh, like what kind of data is shared, um, and how the community is prepared to analyze and make use of that data in a way that actually like is helpful towards democratic governance and 
accountability oversight of companies. So that's kind of like where we are now. Um, so it's great to be in this panel to be thinking through like what kinds of data should we be considering? Who might be granted access? What are the mechanisms to do that? What are the kind of accountability mechanisms so that the balance of power sits well within that ecosystem? Um, how do we actually like achieve these broad democratic goals that we're trying to achieve through data access? So I'll stop there. Great. Okay, so uh, I think that dovetails into one of the um, kind of concerns that was brought up in the last panel, which is, uh, you know, it's great to have data access, but some of the pushback we get is concerns around privacy of the data, how is that protected, what about trade secrets, and that ultimately leads to a question of, these are researchers and um, they are trusted in some respects with very important information, and how can we, how can the implementation um, enforce that trust and kind of allay some of those concerns around privacy and access to confidential or sensitive information. Information. So um, maybe I'll throw it. Does someone want to lead off on that, or? Yeah, I can. I can jump in there and then tee it up. And yeah. Um, so I, I guess I would say like to take a step back as we're kind of designing data access regimes. I think. There's a number of factors that need, we need to consider. Um, some of those are what our principles are. So that's things like balancing privacy and security and competition and the ethical and public interest use of data, um, as well as academic freedom for researchers. Um, and maybe I, I consider researchers broadly, as Becca was saying, to include journalists, um, civil society, and public interest researchers. There are, um, there's a range of types of research that's important and needed in this space. So there's like the kind of maybe longer term, deeper dive research that academics are very well placed to do. There's also like rapid response, short term research um, that civil society is often well placed to do. Civil society might do longer term research too, but like that's kind of broadly how I see the, those fields um, taking up these different types of work. Um, so let's say like, research freedom, not just academic freedom, but we kind of need to think about like, what are all of our principles that we're trying to design against and how do we balance them? Um, and so yes, we need to think carefully about privacy and security, but like the end goal is that we want public, in like there is a public interest use that we need research data for. Um, and so it is very possible, like it's tricky to design for privacy, but it's possible and it's surmountable. <laughs> um, and so we shouldn't like just put that as a barrier of why we cannot proceed. Um, so that's that's kind of how I think the whole of like, how do we design for those principles? And then I kind of think we need to think about who the actors are in the system. So in the DSA, for instance, there's like, there's broadly the regula regulators. So the digital service coordinators play a very key role in the data access regime for the DSA. Um, the companies play a role as well, and researchers have to make requests. And uh, Swati, I think, mentioned on the first panel that like none of kind of the company power should not sit fully with the companies nor with the, the regulators. And so we need to think about designing, and hopefully the, the delegated act does that. And if not, then we'll need to like as a research community um, work to try and kind of balance that power. So one idea that's been proposed, I think that's really promising is having an intermediary body that plays a role between those two power structures. Um, so yeah, thinking about our principles, thinking about who the actors are who are involved, and then thinking about what types of data are researchers requesting. And I think depending on the types of data, then and who is making the request, then you're kind of balancing across like how sensitive is that data and what type of institution is that researcher sitting within and what uh, like what levels of data protection can that institution offer? Um, what kinds of experience does that institution have with doing that kind of data protection or like going through public, uh, like ethical use cases and kind of what are their own practices and how can they demonstrate that they are like a trusted body to be able to um, to take 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 care of the data that they'll be interested with. Um, we can talk more about like what are all the ways that we could try and ask 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 that of um, institutions or, or researchers who will be requesting that data. But yeah, I think that's how I would like start to think about the ecosystem. Great. Um, 
Yeah, uh, <clears throat> at the risk of sounding like uh, Captain Obvious, I mean, this is a very sophisticated uh, audience, but I mean, these questions obviously entail very delicate balancing acts, right? There are inherent tensions between making data available, letting information flow freely to numerous parties while ensuring that the data is adequately protected. Um, an overly permissive uh, access regime could introduce or empower bad actors, uh, but an overly strict or conservative one would undermine the goals, as you mentioned, not just of the regulators, researchers, good intentions, but also even the best interests of the public and of users. Um, and so this tension from our perspective obviously requires a constant balancing of equities um, and multi-stakeholder conversations. And in, in my opinion, and I know that not everybody agrees with this, and there have been many efforts to come to voluntary commitments and, and many efforts uh, to have multi-stakeholder uh, conversations that have not necessarily been helpful and others necessarily have. But we think it's a major, major um, important part of uh, this conversation. Um, I think of, you know, we're all very familiar with the term privacy by design. I like to think of the term inclusivity by design, whether that inclusivity means researchers, whether it means underrepresented communities, whether it means users and um, just all across the stakeholder um, ecosystem um, that springs to mind. And you also touched on something um, and that's and I think that's that trust and the questions that we're looking at it's going to depend on context what kind of data are we sharing is it um, publicly available data that one posts on their social media and how does that differ from obviously more legally and policy wise sensitive types of information um, and so i think uh, yeah you made you made great points in those regards yeah, just to build on that, I think that um, a lot of our work has been really centered on that question of publicly available data and what's considered public. Um, and also that definition of like who might be considered a researcher and can have access to that data. And I think when we're talking about privacy, it's really important, as you mentioned, to understand the context in which that data exists and also develop regimes based on the sensitivity of that data. So. Um, one of the concerns I have with how the DSA implementation has been rolling out is that we run the risk of being really surface level if we aren't um, really clear about what the pieces of data are that are being asked for and what the audience that is asking for it is. And so one of these examples, um, just looking at Article 39 in the DSA, which is focused on ad repositories, um, this is something that platforms have made previous commitments, voluntary commitments around. And I think one of the things that came up in the last panel was some of the failures around volunta voluntary commitments and um, uh, sort of the ways in which it lit a fire under a lot of platforms to carry out some of these things. But what actually got rolled out maybe wasn't necessarily the most useful to researchers. Um, we last month um, with uh, this organization called Check First, just published a, a really large analysis of the various ad APIs that have been offered by the very large online platforms named uh, in the DSA. And really what we found is that none of them so far are up to task for doing good monitoring of social media data in Europe, especially in the context of 2024 elections. And some of the, the reasons for this is, you know, basic things like usability. So the platform itself um, was breaking, it was difficult to navigate. There are other deeper questions about the accuracy of the data. So when you try to harmonize what's in the ad repository that's required by the DSA versus maybe an API, it's, um, there's often really inaccurate or missing data. So I think one of the challenges is that, you know, yes, um, platforms are required to do this, but there's still quite a lot of room for our, us to articulate what we think good implementation should look like and what it shouldn't look like. And I think this is where everyone in this room and in this larger conversation can really get clear and articulate this is what we think is meaningful. Um, the other thing I'll touch on as well is I think that the bar is so low right now in terms of things that are public that also are really impactful. So, you know, for example, political advertising. This is something that I think we all kind of universally agree should be available. We should have more information about influence on these platforms and yet even that is very difficult for platforms to achieve so i think that we need to have a big conversation about you know something that's publicly available that probably is low on in terms of sensitivity 
platforms are not fully succeeding at even making that data available. So I think that's a big question we need to ask um, as we think about the different categories of data. Yeah, maybe one, one thing to just pick up on there, I think, is um, so for Article 40 in the DSA, where researchers can request specific uh, data sets of platforms, like that is just going to get started soon. And so I think researchers um, and the research community should be thinking about like what are test data sets to be asking for um, and think about like what is data that we kind of know reasonably could be publicly like could be requested and given to us and that could do something useful that we haven't been able to analyze before. So maybe thinking about different types of um, like public public uh, content that is publicly available. Again, the question of like what counts as publicly available data is a whole can of worms. <laughs> but um, and even like maybe arc like data that's been taken down and could have, could have possibly been archived is something to be like that could be interesting. Like I don't know what counts as like when platforms are removing spam under spam uh, anti spam policies. Like what is that? That's like what's what. What's an archive of like? Could you ask for an archive data set of what that's looked like over time? They might not have that now, but if you made that ask, like, could we build a regime where over time that could be the type of data set that could be asked for? Um, so I, I I would really encourage the research community to be thinking about um, building asks or test data sets um, and thinking about what questions those data sets could ask or could like could, could answer, um, and then like that at least within the DSA that regime will look different across or ideally it should not look different but it is possible that it could look different across different countries so um asks will go to different digital services different digital service coordinators um Ireland is a really key like plays a very key role in this ecosystem um but I think it would could be interesting to have asks that go to different places and think about what comes back and like could that be kind of audited and what do we learn from doing that. Um, that's a big administrative lift to ask of researchers. Um, and so I think having like an independent um, the coalition that um, brings together independent technology researchers, which I'm also a member of, um, and many Berkman folks helps um, helps to bring get off the ground. Um, that that's a group that like could play a really interesting role there, but I'm sure there are many other groups that could do that as well. And I think, yeah, just trying to think about like how can how can the ecosystem work together to kind of like have test cases and see where they go. So uh, I think those are great points and they kind of spurred a couple of thoughts on my part. I am generally approaching a lot of these issues uh, from the perspective of the DMA and data portability in general. Um, but what I have noticed is that there are criticisms that folks aren't doing enough, at least with respect to the DMA and the recent March 7th implementation deadline. And I think that, you know, as we talk about what are some of the questions that we need to answer, I think it's really important to remember that some of these questions about proper scope uh, and, and additional conversations that need to happen, this is going to be an iterative process. Uh, progress will be made, but there are a lot of things that still need to be figured out and that's we can't just assume that the very first thing that we all try is going to work and so I think I get the sense that sometimes folks forget that um, and that was sort of just my gut reaction to what you just mentioned. Yeah I mean even like I think it will be iterative right like no ask knowing what data to ask for and if that data is like collated and exists within a way that's a form that's like shareable from platforms to researchers like that's going to be a whole process and it probably will be like long and complicated <laughs> to really get there but hopefully over time I mean as Gabe was talking about like building towards a regime for a data sharing regime in other sectors like in, in the healthcare sector I think like it's it will probably take a while to get to a place where like there's like We've, we've developed practice. Um, I think the intermediary body that's also been discussed could play a really interesting role in setting standards of like what can data access requests look like, um, what kinds of standards might platforms offer in terms of like having documentation for the data that they offer and like there's a bunch of stuff that can be got, done to make it easier so that we can like get, get to a place where it's more regularized. And, and to your point about this being iterative, I think that I would encourage anyone who's a researcher to go and apply for access um, via some of these public portals because 
They've just been rolled out. You can learn a lot about what data you can get access to via them. And I think um, the research community right now is already doing some information sharing with each other about which plant platforms have granted them access and which haven't. They've been sharing their applications to try to determine what the decision making might be. Um, so I would encourage everyone, if you can, to go and apply for that and, and share that information. I believe it's the Coalition for Independent Tech Research that's, that's collecting that information. <laughs> but I, get, on your point about it being iterative, I think it's really important that we be engaged as much as possible, especially, you know, some platforms have not released public documentation about what's in their APIs. It's a lot of like back and forth of requesting. They say they don't have it requesting. Um, I also think there's definitely room for um, sort of a surface audit of the different platforms. So really getting a good sense of what is publicly available that if I as a user went and was scrolling on a public feed, I could be asking for in terms of metrics and engagement. So I think there's a real opportunity, um, I'll say from like civil society research side, to really collect that data and determine what, what could we be asking for if the platforms um, haven't yet made it available via their API or other means. That's great. Um, actually, that leads very well to the next question I had, um, which is, um, it is an iterative process and we need to learn lessons. Are there um, things that come to mind, lessons that we already should surface for everybody to know about what has worked, what hasn't worked in the past, or maybe in other domains that are similar to this that could inform how this should look going forward? Um, well, I think Gabe talked about a lot of the lessons that have been learned in, in what worked and what didn't work um, in different voluntary access regimes. Um, I'll maybe speak a bit. Um, I, I managed um, a data sharing, a researcher access to data program on Twitter. We specifically shared just one, one type of data, which was um, uh, identified information operations that had been removed from the platform. So it was a, an archive of data, basically. Um, and in that program, um, we were able to share data with researchers from academia, um, journalism, and civil society, and so I think that can work, um, and we should, like, very much should look for ways for the broad research community um, to, to get access to data, so that's, that's one thing that I would, yeah, um, I might have seen. I would point to CrowdTangle as, a, as an example. Um, and the reason I want to highlight it is because I think we've all been talking about how there's been sort of a retrenchment when it comes to um, transparency initiatives that are voluntary, that are coming from platforms, and the likelihood of a platform releasing a CrowdTangle-like tool feels less likely now than it did like five years ago. And um, I think I raise it because I think that there's an opportunity to kind of get clear on what needs to be what's publicly available that's massively impactful and we should sort of um, create opportunities for broad sets of researchers in the public to be able to look at and access that data, in addition to some of these more um, gated or um, narrow bands of researchers who have access and so um, you know, Facebook recently announced that they are rolling back CrowdTangle in favor of a different content library that doesn't necessarily have all of the features that CrowdTangle had around search functionality, um, download uh, capabilities, and a lot of other tooling. So I think it's a question for us to articulate, which is what do we want to see in terms of um, some of the uh, transparency offerings that are getting released? Yeah, that's a great, I think, um, first, shout out to Brandon Silverman, who um, led CrowdTangle and I think is really doing like phenomenal advocacy work since then, um, and he's worked a lot with Rebecca Trumbull, who's also uh, helped fund the coalition and has done like just so much work in the space. Um, but yeah, I think a, a huge lesson from that is usability. Um, so there's like if platforms are providing data, but it's not in a form that is accessible or usable um, for researchers, especially often for civil society researchers, I think, um, or groups that um, maybe are like building out tools for the first time. There's, you know, it's not reasonable to expect platforms to build like to have every single option, like the, you know, a super high touch, like perfect, uh, tool, but they should be thinking about usability. It's not 
helpful if we have data sets that like people aren't able to make any use of. Um, so I think that's really important. And a way that, that we can make data more usable is to have uh, like those, those programs designed through conversation with researchers. So I think it's really important to ask, like there's been so much asking of researchers what they need and we should be mindful of their time and energies and go back to look at like, like this is not new. There's been work over a long time to think about like what's needed. Um, we don't need to do all this work from scratch, but to platforms should like do their homework and, and like look and think about what have, has the research community asked for. And then I think as they're rolling out tools, like roll out betas and ask people to test it and get feedback and like over time to, um, yeah, to like really build on it. I think hopefully it's not just a compliance exercise where it's like, we're just putting something out because it needs to be put out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I think this is a good opportunity for to perhaps talk about some of the trust model work that data, the data transfer initiative has undertaken recently. And again, this is in the context of Article 6.9 of the Digital Markets Act, which requires direct reporting to third parties. Um, but you know, nothing in that law specifies how harm should be mitigated. There are no details or requirements as to how third parties could or should be authorized from a security or privacy perspective. Um, so many important questions related to a lot of things we've talked about today arise. How can the originating service be service be confident that data will not introduce security and other risks? And how will users be confident that their transfers reflect their understanding and their intentions, most importantly, their intentions? Um, so in, in order to, to protect the interests of third parties, of end users, of services, um, DTI has drafted an initial security and safety model. Uh, and while this work was inspired by the DMA, it's meant to uh, uh, to be its broader goal is actually to help um, grow trust in in many other contexts beyond um, beyond that space, uh, no matter the party at issue or the jurisdiction in which they're located. And the, some of the clear benefits that, that we see in this approach, um, because I think your question was sort of about lessons learned, and this would be lessons learned from another context. Um, our main goal is to to guide structure and align um, independent impl implementation in an effort towards more consistency and harmonization. Um, because what we've heard is that right now everybody's sort of doing their own things. Um, and so we see this approach as preferable to companies or, and folks just sort of independently developing their own mechanisms, promotes greater neutrality and consistency. It requires buy-in and acceptance uh, of a baseline set of requirements at least. Um, and it promotes efficiency. And so uh, I want to be cognizant of our, our time, our limited time, but um, I do want to encourage you all to, to look at the Data Transfer Initiative's website and our related trust model work there. Thank you. Thank you. And I, at this point, I wanted to open it up to the audience. Are there questions from the audience uh, for our panelists? Yeah, I just. Hey everyone, um, does this work? It works, yes. Um, <laughs> one of the things that seems particularly like a wicked problem in all of this is that definition of public. And I just wonder, um, because we sort of talked around it being hard, um, maybe is there anything that you all have learned in your efforts that are, are like useful bright lines between public and private or useful working <laughs> With language around public and not public, it would just be, anyway, it could be very interesting. I, I can start off quickly. Um, this is a concept that, it, this is not the first time this concept has come up. It's been in federal private privacy legislation for gosh knows how long, at least 15 years. Um, but it, I, from my perspective, it's all about, and maybe it's different for, youth, for researchers, but user-centric. What do the users want? And that's, that's how we should build our solutions, at least at DTI. Uh, it should be all about what the user wants. And Yeah, I think that there are a lot of complexities at play because, for example, a private Facebook group that has hundreds of members, should that be considered public speech? Like, is that something that we should have access to versus a post that someone made on TikTok that was targeting a very small group of friends that technically is public and you can grab it, but the intent of it was not 
public in that way. So I think there's a lot of really thorny questions that we are just beginning to work through on this question about, and you have to factor in the intent of the user and, and who the audience was yes. for, but also you have to factor in what is the influence of that? What is that influence of that Facebook group that has hundreds of members? Yeah, I think, um, I know one way platforms have thought about this in the past is uh, thinking about if one, if content is actually public, so it's on the open internet. So I think there's separate, one, is it on the open internet? Or two, is it only through like logged in access? That's like some layers. Um, then if it's on the open internet, like do you have a number of followers? That's actually one threshold that platforms have used. So like, um, and that again, uh, relies on a follower based model for the platform. Uh, <laughs> not all platforms are that way. Um, so you need to think about it depending on like what you're, how you're, the platform that you're looking at is designed. Um, but you could have a threshold of like 5,000 followers or 10,000 followers um, as a like measure of publicness. Um, but yeah, I mean, like what's the right number? We, I don't think we have great answers. Um, and then if there's not a right answer, it's like what, do, what, can, what can the community and what can users come to a place that like feels comfortable? I also think then there needs to be options for users to opt out. Mm -hmm. um, that's very tricky. Once you've shared data, then sometimes you cannot be like, there's, it's not perfect, um, but there should be some way for users to opt out um, and some way for users to like have a sense of what's happening with their data. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's like, we are also the, like we, we all say users, but it's, it's us. <laughs> like, um, so, so I think thinking about like, what do we feel comfortable with? Um, and who is we and how do we, what what kind of bodies do we use to try and um, land on a standard or norm that feels okay. There's also, um, I should say there's, there's groups that have done this already, like the Association of Internet Researchers has ethical guidance around um, doing this kind of research. I'm sure there are other groups, but that's the one that I'm most familiar with. So. We have a question there and then, and then we'll go to the back. This is a, a broad strategy question is it uh, important to have the same uh, API, the same access uh, implementation for research as well as uh, user uh, portability uh, reasons? Um, or is it uh, more useful to separate those two kinds of uh, portability definitions? Uh, in practice, and I'm talking again strategically in terms of adoption as well as in terms of uh, just facilitating the research itself. Well, I think the panelists, uh, I think I'm looking up there, Gabriel, is, I, I think, touched on this issue and he sort of pointed to data portability in the researcher context, a limitation of that being that, well, you only get certain amounts of the, certain parts of data, right? It's only I don't want to misspeak, but you, it, there are limitations on that. Um, so, I mean, from a user perspective, I think that perhaps there should be limitations, um, again, to go along with the, the expectations of a, of a user. And um, it doesn't seem right to me that perhaps you should be allowed to share everything and anything that's associated with an account. Um, and so that, that's a point that I, in the back of the room, was making to myself as Gabriel was speaking earlier. That doesn't answer your question, but it is along the same lines of thinking. Yeah. We're seeing sort of as this implementation around the DSA is happening, we're seeing platforms carried out in a lot of different ways. So some platforms have taken their commercial API and they're pointing researchers to that. Others have created a brand new API and they're saying this is our researcher API and here are the requirements you need to meet in order to be a researcher. And then obviously there's also the model of like the broad public, what kind of data might they want to access? And if they're not programmers, they need to be able to access some sort of repository to look at that data. And that might be applicable to public interest researchers who don't know how to code, for example. So I think that the audience really matters. Um, and we really need to make sure that what's provided is meaningful to each of those audiences. Otherwise, we just run the risk of this being like compliance theater that's really surface mm -hmm. level, is what I would say. Yeah, that, I, I agree because like a, a user portability interface wouldn't have things like what ads are being shown or what your ad profile is like because you wouldn't necessarily be interested in as a user. 
And similarly, commercial APIs wouldn't have wouldn't have the complete data that you might be interested as a researcher because it would be designed for a certain audience. So that totally makes sense. Uh, there was a question in the back. I wanted a uh, couple answers ago. You started with whatever the user wants. Well, the user wants everything free and no data collected, right? So my question is, wouldn't it, if you really want to give what user wants, shouldn't you try to give the options? Like you get this for free in exchange for this much data, you have to pay this much if you want to exchange that data, and so forth and so on. Isn't that the most way that the user will get what they want? I think I misspoke. I think I think I said that. Um, I think what I meant is it needs to align with the user's expectations. So uh, that's <laughs> I apologize for misspeaking. Um, but most users have unreasonable expectations, right? <laughs> um, whatever those expectations are, I'm not sure it's my place to pass value judgments on that. I think it's hopefully the goal is to make sure that their um, wants are effectuated. That's a tough question. I'm not sure if you all have thoughts. I mean, I feel like the bar is so low right now in terms of explainability, like what kinds of information the end user is getting. Mm -hmm. um, I won't go too far down this path, but we ran a study last year that was basically an experimental al algorithmic audit of the user controls that are offered for managing your recommendations. And that was one of our main findings was just that people didn't feel like they had good information about how these systems work. They didn't feel like YouTube directed them to good information about how to use these tools. And so, you know, regardless of whether the end user wants tons of information, yeah. tons yeah. of control or none, I think we need to be able to give people those options. Right. Otherwise, it under, undermines trust in the, in the entirety of the system. Exactly. Yeah, I think we're like this today is mostly focusing around researcher access to data, but there's a whole other conversation around transparency and like transparency from like going all the way back to thinking about like how the, how platforms are designed and what information is shared as a like as you're navigating uh, using a platform and understanding yeah what what is happening when and why um, whole other whole other day could be hosted on that. <laughs> I feel like trying to guess what users want or expect is, is probably a can of words you don't want to go down. And, uh, you know, I feel like personally, users are perfectly happy to be surprised about things they didn't expect if there are good things that are beneficial. So it feels like the focus should be more on encouraging beneficial uses and ways of accessing data than trying to guess what users would expect or not expect or be surprised by. I also add, I just want to go back to something that Gabriel said in the last panel, which is around how transparency needs to, cannot be sort of the precursor for accountability. You need to have these accountability structures in place for transparency to be meaningful. And so I guess I think about it in that in the context of what does good user facing transparency, for example, look like. If we don't have good accountability mechanisms in place, if we don't have good legislation or repercussions, um, then it, it's not really a meaningful exercise. So I think it's really important to couch that in that context. And we don't always have to guess what users want. We can engage in meaningful dialogues with them. Back to my multi-stakeholder pitch. <laughs> um, Lisa? Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask a question about how we should be thinking about the costs to companies. Very interesting also in your perspectives because you all have very different relationships to companies. But a lot of times when you hear about building out researcher access to data mechanisms, companies basically say, our data isn't organized in this way. We have to re-engineer a bunch of things. We got to do all this stuff with our databases. I guess my questions are, first off, is this true? Is it a really large expense to companies? And the second question is, should we care? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think it's semi-true. Um, yes, like I, I think data is probably not organized internally within, I mean, I don't know, but my guess would be within most companies, like at the level that we think that it might be from the outside because that tends to be how all organizations work. <laughs> um, um, 
So yeah, I mean, my guess would be to make data, like to put it into forms that are useful to researchers and to get it to them probably is a bigger effort than we think that it is. Um, and probably requires resources and, or and def I definitely requires like not insignificant resources to do well. Um, and I think that should be their public interest obligation. So like that's, and part of the reason we are moving into a regulated space in this way is that like that was taken as a public interest obligation like in fits and starts and was not always um, followed through in ways that were, were, were useful um and so that's part of the goal of having a right like moving towards um a more regulated area is that like companies are are moving towards having public interest obligations in a different kind of way so yeah um. So I, I can't speak to the inner workings of various companies, but obviously it's going to depend on the size of the company, right? I mentioned earlier we work with companies of all sizes. Right now, uh, it's our founding members who are the large ones, but we are actively working um, with smaller companies as well. Um, but that's part of the hope at DTI is to help sort of lessen that burden there with the consist consistency and harmonization that I alluded to earlier. Um, because I don't think it's something that anybody should hide behind, and I don't know the route, you know, I can't see, I can't speak to what, what happens inside closed doors, but we're here to help if that is a concern. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say, again, I also don't know as well, but I just, I do know from having talked to and worked with engineers at the Mozilla Corporation side, there are lots of things you can do, and it is resource intensive, but if it is core to your, if you have sort of a public interest goal and it's core to your mission, you can do a lot really well. So for example, um, you know, we did an audit of some of these public APIs um, and we found that Twitter right now is just offering essentially a CSV that's really slow to load. And that, for me, that's just kind of the bare minimum. Yes, it takes resources to be able to build a dashboard or a repository or a good API, but I think that we can expect a lot more from these platforms. Yeah. Having spent some time as an engineer inside some of these organizations, mm -hmm. I would say that, especially social media or organized companies, they're they're organized around monetizing, collecting and monetizing data. So they're better positioned to analyze data than most other organizations in the world. And of course, I, I, I want to say it's hard to say what's high cost and low cost in a very general way because it really depends on the case. But they, they should be able to do it at a, at a reasonable cost because that's kind of how they're organized. That being said, they're organized for internal access to data for their businesses and making it available to the outside brings in a whole bunch of other complexities and that's where the cost is gonna come in around regulation, around complexity. So the, I think whatever regulatory framework is designed has to be designed with minimizing those costs. It's not actually getting the data together. I think that's the easy part. It's making it available to people outside the company. That's the complexity. All right, so uh, was there another? Yeah, um, so we've had a lot of an analogies to um, uh, uh, health information. And one of the things that it made me think about is in health research, you know, you have a lot of uh, patient-centered kind of uh, research models. Um, and you were talking a lot about, you know, users and communities and all these things. It, it made me wonder if part of our discussion around sort of access to data also has to have a component around um, how we think about um, stewardship models, governance models around data. So just even to think about the publicly available information example. So in Canadian privacy law, the federal private sector, right, There's all, we have lots of different levels of the law. Um, you can, the publicly available information is outside of kind of what's regulated, but only if it's listed in regulations. It has to be publicly available and listed in the regulations. Um, this is why Clearview AI was an easy privacy case in, in Canada, because people are like, well, it's just collecting public information. It's like, no, 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 it has to be publicly available and listed in the regulations to be out. So there's this role to kind of have a little more granularity about that. But you could imagine instead of it being in regs and in that kind of that kind of a governance structure, you could have a different kind of governance structure, right? You could have a user-based one, which isn't about necessarily individuals voting their preferences in some way, but some kind of more collective deliberation. And if you had a process that had some legitimacy to it, then you could stand by sort of, you know, these are the norms. There could be a way of kind of marking them. Um, and so 
it seems to me that there's like, you know, I've always thought that there's sort of these access questions were missing this other sort of, you know, stewardship mechanism um, component that brings a lot of more people into the conversation um, about some of this. Um, and I was just kind of throwing that out to see what, what your reflections on that would. I have a lot of thoughts about this, <laughs> um, largely because our model for doing research is a community driven model. So our data donation program relies on having these tens and thousands of community members who have agreed to donate their data, who are opting in. And this is something we've thought about a lot is sort of that, um, that infrastructure in terms of relationships that needs to be in place in order to build trust with that community so that they understand you know, what data is being collected when they've downloaded the browser extension and opted in, ensuring that we you know, communicate not only sort of how we're stewarding that data, but also there's constant communication about how we're using that data, what kind of research we're doing. Um, in many cases, asking them what they are worried about and want us to research. So we believe that there's a way that you can do that with a community when you're doing data donation so that you're um, not sort of just collecting data or um, using data in one way, but that it's sort of an ongoing iterative process. Yeah, I think, um... I don't want to speak for his work, but Nate Matias has done a lot of work in this space as well. And I think thinking about like how to work with communities um, and if and then, yeah, ask questions that are then useful, like the answers can be useful and helpful and shape policy that's beneficial to those communities. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really important piece of, of like this whole puzzle that um, goes back to the like we are the users. <laughs> we should think about how to make this work relevant to whatever communities the, the work is about. Oh. Is, is it, do we have a question from Jeff there, or is it money? Like, I kind of lost track. Okay, let me go ahead. Um, so just building on Lisa's question, I, I guess like the added component I would kind of throw in there is around like shared incentives. So in health, there's clear shared incentives on both sides to participate in that model. Same with the data donation. So in the context of corporations and the general public, how do we get to a set of shared incentives that encourage people on all ends to participate? I think that's the part where we always kind of, you know, it's, a, it's one of those wicked problems. How do we get to shared incentive structures? And they don't have to be the same incentives for everybody, but I think we need to start thinking about what those incentives are. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a really tough question because I don't, I'm not sure those incentives will ever entirely line up, but I do feel like there are mechanisms we can be working through like regulation or like sort of a shared conversation um, around people's well-being on these platforms. Like, I, I think there are ways that we can talk about it. I'm not totally sure incentives will ever line up, um, but I don't know if either of you would disagree with that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I think, I think that, like, users and that if you can show that, like, having public interest research about what's happening on platforms is, like, that, that brings us evidence to be able to, yeah, shape policy, shape, uh, shape the design of platforms, like that can align people towards an incentive structure where like, we are trying to make these big systems that are really integral to our day to day life, like better. Um, it's not the incentives are never going to fully line up probably because that's just how things work in large systems. Um, but yeah, I think that if you can start to show like, here's the type of work that we're doing with this um with this data and like here's how in the long term these we could make these platforms more trusted um like over time maybe that's one way yeah i mean you don't have to and it's not um plausible or <laughs> possible to agree with every you know everyone in a multi-stakeholder group for example um but you can align on broader goals and and you know for us at dti it's you know making sure that there's a broader ecosystem of data portability thrives um, so for, for me, that, that that's my goal, um, but I'm sure with additional thought and conversation, it, it'll become more clear. Yeah, I think you can kind of align on like big, broad, shared principles and um, like things like we can all align around 
like wanting democratic governance, for instance, um, or and maybe we never, not everyone can always align with that, but we can try and align. We can try and align communities that, uh, on that in ways that um, push things forward. So yeah. Might squeeze in just a question from our online audience very quickly, um, touching on some of the the social science questions discussed on the first panel that really would benefit from these large data sets. Um, they're just curious about the state of play of the privacy protecting methods and I guess maybe some of the, the complexity about making that data available to external audiences. It's a great question. <laughs> well, from a technical perspective, having done some research in this area, I think the privacy protecting methods that well, a lot of the regulation is pushing is pretty far behind what is techn technologically feasible. So there definitely has to be work kind of bringing the regulatory and technology communities together to kind of agree on what is like a good standard for privacy protection. I'm just talking about the privacy part. There's, of course, many facets to that, but particularly in the privacy protected parts, because I think that was in the question, um, there, there is work to be done to bring it um, to a better standard. Yeah, I mean, there's there's like techniques like data clean rooms that could be used. There's a variety of techniques that can be used, but I think, yeah, I would say like we will be exploring um, like how can data clean rooms support some of the goals of the DSA, for instance. That will be something that will I think be emerging, um, and then like all sorts of privacy preserving techniques that like didn't work so well in some of the other big data sets. So um, I think TBD, if they could be be uh, used effectively as we move forward. So we'll see. Talking about wicked problems and uh, uh, user's perspective uh, as a marketing scientist and the consumer behavior scientist, we do know a lot about what, what, what people think. But what I would, uh, would like to know um, is transparency. Each three or four, three of you have been touching about, uh, about transparency. What do you think? Is it transparency, how it should be? How is it different than explainability, the compliance type of transparency? Because it, it seems like what we are talking about here is not really transparency that we are talking about here is not really what has been explainability compliance transparency where we are going towards accept all type of compliance thank you Like to give another question. What is transparency? Yeah, I, I, again, it's <laughs> what's useful to the audience. Maybe so. Explainability obviously is very useful to a consumer audience. I'm thinking maybe there are things that are important to researchers and others that aren't of mm, interest. <laughs> it's it's going to be context dependent. That's why I have a wishy washy answer. But I am looking forward to hearing your all thoughts. Yeah, I would go back to just sort of what we were talking about before, which is that transparency is only meaningful if it's tied to mechanisms for accountability and if you have the means to enforce those systems. So I think I go back to that, which is that transparency really is only a, a means to an end and, and making sure that we focus that on those accountability mechanisms being in place will help inform what pieces of data we ask for or um, kind of what users would say is meaningful to them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of transparency as a lever um, towards accountability and other um, goals. I don't think of it just as a lever for accountability. I think it helps us understand the world we're living in. Um, I think it can help us collaborate across stakeholders better. So if we have information that can help align incentives by bringing stakeholders like, from across companies, from across civil society, from across regulators, like it can help. We, we can only kind of align around goals and know what we want to do if we have the baseline information. Um, and I think it can help build trust. Um, so yeah, I think like transparency is always tied to accountability, but, or should, <laughs> transparency is not always, but should be tied to accountability if it's, um, if we're doing things right. Yeah, so that's 
and I think broadly, I mean, what we're talking to me, what we're talking and thinking about when we're thinking about researcher access to data as like one of the facets of a very wide range of what transparency can mean is like researchers can kind of like independently investigate and produce insights and produce understanding from data that we have all created as being users on platforms um, and that like the platform ecosystems have helped create and that that helps policymakers and platforms and us as people decide how we want to kind of shape the world that we're living in together collectively across whatever levers are available to us. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks so much. Uh, I just had one question about the difference between academic research and public interest research that's relevant to this, and that's about IRB approval. So one reason why academic researchers maybe focus on in-depth uh, or maybe like it takes longer is we have to go through these institutional review boards that talk about our interests, especially on human subject research, uh, which you know you don't have to do in a non-academic setting. And so um, I'm sure there are other standards that you all adhere to, but it's very different than, and so it takes forever in some institutions to get this approved. Um, so I'm wondering if we have um, collaborations between academics and public interest. Uh, you know, for example, I run a research lab. I can very much see some of my interns working at one of the organizations. Um, but for those kinds of uh, academic and public interest collaborations, do you expect then um, to have not incentives to collaborate because you'll have to follow the academic process, which can be slow um, and can have all this other uh, obstacles uh, to using the data that you know once you get access to because I feel like that's something that's um, a, a problem because we should be collaborating more right like we have a bunch of people asking for the same data sometimes for the same questions we're duplicating efforts kind of talking about research uh, resources but I think there are some like very clear barriers to collaboration too including something like academic IRB and, and not um, so, but I don't know if you have had prior experience overcoming those challenges, because I'd be really curious to see um, how that could happen. Yeah, I'll say um, we have collaborated with academic labs before and gone through their IRB processes. Um, we from our side, and this might be unique to Mozilla as a nonprofit, have extremely rigorous standards we have to go through in terms of formal um, data stewardship review, security review, legal review that we have to go through before we even begin to do this kind of research. I think not every nonprofit has access to those resources. And actually, for me, this is a, a, going back to what Gabriel was saying about the crisis in research right now. Um, a lot of people doing this kind of important independent research don't have access to like legal resources, privacy, security resources to even begin this kind of research. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for nonprofit, civil society, journalists to work with academics because they might not have the resources to be able to do that kind of ethical review. Um, we're sort of unique that we do have a ton of those resources to do that kind of review, but not I think not every civil society researcher does. And I also think that from both sides, there are different kinds of questions that are going to be asked about the use of the data, um, the research subjects. And so I think it can be a really fruitful collaboration as well. Yeah, I think plus one to that. And I do think, um, like, I know that there are many civil society research organizations that do either use an IRB, they maybe use, like, uh, just not, a, not an academic institution's IRB, but they use IRBs, um, or they have some other, like, kind of analogous uh, system to an IRB and are thinking very deeply about what ethical research looks like. Um, and yeah, and so I think like collaborations between stakeholders is important. And some of that is like learning, right? So as we're trying to create like effective ethical um, public interest data sharing regimes, how can um, civil society groups learn from what academia does? And maybe there are things that academia does really well and other things that don't aren't working so well right now. And like, how can that be kind of a lesson and vice versa? Um, like what can academic clubs learn from more rapid responsible society work that is, is ethical and is, um, is like kind of considering a bunch of these questions. So I think trying to think about like, what can we learn and where can there be shared resources? Cause I do think this like, capacity question is a really big one um, and it's really important and 
And I'll also say, like, we've really focused on DSA and Europe right now, um, and, this, and the U.S. and Canada in this conversation, but I think, like, research globally is very important. Um, Swati, I think, mentioned that on a prior panel, um, like, access for, especially for global majority researchers, I think is really, really important. Um, and we'll see if there's like um, any kind of like positive spillover effects from access within DSA regimes to other areas of like whether platforms just kind of like make a bit of favor like well we already have an API so now anybody can apply from different regions um like hopefully we see that um I we have a colleague in Brazil who's done some initial work that like so far they, they're not seeing that in Brazil um but it's very early days so we'll see what happens um but yeah, I think I think a fear is that like so much attention and resources go into being in compliance with the DSA and in these other regulatory regulated regimes that um, researchers in other jurisdictions maybe actually like get less resources put towards their their work and that would be a huge shame and I hope that does not happen. Um, and yeah, I just want to make make a like I think research across civil society and across academic institutions, but also across jurisdictions, across, which is complicated for all the reasons that we've talked about, but like as much as possible for people to think about how can we collaborate and like if there's access to data sets or to methodologies, to um, like technologies, to all the kinds of things that build the capacity to be able to do this work, thinking about like how that can be done in a way that the field can benefit as well. Yeah, and I'll add on that. I feel like there's been a huge conversation about the Brussels effect, which, which is essentially like after this is developed in Europe, it will become global. And I think it's really important to interrogate that um, just because, you know, the scenario we don't want happening is that um, the focus on transparency ends up being academics in the US and EU get access to data and no one else has really any meaningful access to public data. So I think that's what we don't want to happen. And I think we're at a, a moment where a watershed moment where we really have the ability to articulate how we think this should go down. Great, wonderful. So uh, I just want to point out that we're at 12.50 here, and uh, there is less, though I know some of you have started, but I want to make sure our panelists get a chance to get some. So um, I'm, well, why don't we continue these conversations over lunch, but I want to thank our panelists one more time for um, the great insightful comments that they have.